Okay, restoring our soil. Before you undergo any endeavor, you want to ask yourself, um, what, what are you wanting to do? What are the problems with, it? why are you doing it? And what problems are you trying to solve? And how you do it? And so that's what I'm going to do here. If you're going to restore soil, first of all, the first course question you want to ask is, is why are you doing it? What's wrong with our soil? Well, several things wrong with our soil. Our world is covered in dysfunctional soil, soil that doesn't work right. Rain doesn't go in it, roots don't grow in it, and nutrients aren't available. And, and if you're a farmer, dysfunctional soils cost you a lot of money. And so um, the, the obvious problem on the farm level with dysfunctional soil is that you don't make any money. Uh, you run a risk of bankruptcy. And this is your livelihood, not only your livelihood, but also your, your legacy. Uh, it's something you hope to pass down to your family in the future. And so when soils don't work at the farm, it's quite catastrophic. And because the, the immediate impact of dysfunctional soil is felt by the farmer, um, we've often dismissed dysfunctional soil as, as a problem solely affecting farmers. And that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, you know, my friend Gail Fuller is fond of saying soil is the, is the answer. What's the question? And if the question is, What's the cause of most of the world's problems throughout history? I think you could say with all seriousness that most of the problems experienced by the human race throughout history can be traced to dysfunctional soil. And I'm not exaggerating. If you think about it, um, flooding is caused by, by dysfunctional soil. Famine caused by dysfunctional soil. Pestilence, diseases caused by misfunctional soil, and warfare caused by dysfunctional soil. And in, in my book, I talk about all of these. Blood, famine, pestilence, and warfare can all be traced to soil misuse and social ills, social and biological ills caused by dysfunctional soil. And now we're faced with another one, and that's the, the specter of climate change. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe climate change is real or if you think that humans are the cause of it. The fact is that the solution, the absolute best solution for preventing climate change, and that is restoring our soil is a good thing to do, regardless of whether climate change is real or whether humans are causing it. The same things that restore our soil can eliminate climate risk, and those same exact actions make our farms more money and make this planet better. And so I'm going to go through those processes, but the first thing I want to do I want to talk about why is our soil in such bad shape? What happened? How did we get here? And the, there are two overriding practices, and I'll explain some of each of these, why they're so bad. And they have been practices that have been ingrained into our agriculture systems for centuries. And the first one is tillage. Tillage is horribly destructive to soil destroys uh, soil structure, causes erosion, as tillage is the primary driver of soil dysfunction. And it's been a part of agriculture for 7,000 or more years. The other major problem or a driver of poor soil is the practice of fallow, letting land sit idle and not grow anything. We used to think that this allowed soil to rest, allowed it to store up moisture, allowed it to, to uh, uh, build up fertility, and nothing could be further from the truth. Fallow doesn't allow soil to rest. 
fallow allows soil to starve. And I'll explain that process. So if we're going to restore soil, what, what's our goal? What are we trying to get to? What kind of soil would be ideal? What, what kind of soil are we striving for? And what would it do? And it would do these things. It would absorb rainfall. We want it to hold moisture for a long period of time. We want roots to be able to grow into it very deeply. And we want it to supply mineral nutrients when the plant needs it, in the quantities that the plant needs it. So how do we change the soil we have into the soil we want? Now, when I went to college, um, I was told a couple things. And told of several things actually. <laughs> I went to college for seven years, so I, I was told a lot of things. But when it came to soil, making soil better, um, the approach that we used for most of the last hundred and some years is that we need, we fix soil with fertilizer. Now this is a picture from uh, 1881. I'm not sure if you can tell what that man is standing, what that pile consists of, what the man is standing on. But I included this little article from the, my hometown newspaper. And the uh, gentleman whose name is highlighted in blue there, Dan Yoakum, my great, great grandfather, he was a bone collector. He went down into Oklahoma where the bison were slaughtered, collected bones, put them on a rail car, shipped them back to Colony, Kansas, where they were ground up and used as fertilizer. That's a lot of work to get fertilizer. And uh, our soils needed fertilizer applied to them or they didn't grow anything. And of course, once we got commercial fertilizer, when they found out you could mine rock phosphate, treat it with acid, and you know, pull anhydrous ammonia out of the air, we found out that, um, Fertilization was easy, um, but it didn't really make soil better. It supplied minerals, but it didn't make the soil more productive. We, we, we still, and we got better yields, but when it didn't rain, crops still died. The soil was, was more chemically fertile, but it really wasn't inherently more productive. It didn't soak in rain any better after you applied fertilizer. It didn't. What, what actually makes, what is it about a soil that makes, makes it better? You say, here's poor soil, here's better soil. What is the characteristic between the two that makes it better? And the answer to that is organic matter, carbon. Organic matter is composed primarily of carbon. So how do you get more carbon into the soil. How do you get more organic matter in the soil? In my agronomy courses, I said I was told a couple of things in college. When I took courses in agronomy, broad scale agriculture, they said, well, you can't. You can't increase your soil organic matter. It takes thousands of years to build soil organic matter. So no point in even trying. It's always going to be going down. The best you can do is to maintain it. And it's going to slowly degrade over time. Like, that's depressing. <laughs> Whoa, what? Think about that. That's a heck of a life view, isn't it? That makes you optimistic for the future. The best you can do is maybe maintain it, and it's going to go down anyhow. That sounds to me like civilization is at some point doomed. And you read things like that. Uh, United Nations report says we have 60 years worth of farming before all our soils are so dysfunctional, we can no longer raise food on this planet. That's a little ominous. Now, when I took horticulture classes or read horticulture books, gardening books, they were a lot more optimistic. They said, oh, this is easy. All you got to do is apply a whole bunch of compost. Said, and you can increase your soil organic. Easy. Okay, so where do I get compost? Well, you, you just 
gather up a whole bunch of uh, lawn clippings and leaf drop and you know leaves that you raked up, let them rot, and you, and you put them on your garden. Okay, so where do I get the lawn clippings? And leaf? Well, you go over there and get them, and you put them in this pile and you make them rot and you, you carry it over to the field. So, so, okay, so how am I increasing organic matter here? I'm not really increasing it, I'm just moving it. I'm moving it from the lawn and below the tree to my garden. I'm just transferring. And I'm, during this transfer, it takes, unless I wanna make a lot of trips with carrying this on my back, I'm probably burning fossil fuel to do it. If we're to fix the soil on the entire planet, you know, that's one acre garden may have taken 10 acres of lawn clippings to make the compost to enrich the garden. There are no 10 other earths where we can rob the organic matter from those planets to fix this planet. Ultimately, if we're going to fix the soils on this planet, we need to figure out how to do it on each and every acre without burning fossil fuel to move compost around or to move manure around. The solutions have to be developed using sunlight and rainfall on each and every acre. So, um, how do we do that? And I think that to illustrate that, I wanna show you this picture. This is the Redwoods, Northern California. Visited these and you think, man, here are 300 foot tall trees. 300 foot tall trees. If you were to clip dry, weigh, and analyze the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, iron, zinc, manganese, etc., content in a three 100 foot thick layer of vegetation, what's the nutrient content? And this soil, believe me, is not anything special. It's granite boulders. How can you grow a 300 foot thick layer? Think about this. When you cut these trees down, if you put a football field superimposed on one of these trees, it would stretch from goalpost to goalpost, and the trunk diameter would be thicker, would be taller when that tree is laying flat. The trunk diameter is taller than the goalpost. These are big trees. Think of the nutrients contained in that biomass. Where did it come from? Who applied the fertilizer? How come on our crop fields, our crop fields, you don't apply fertilizer, corn gets three foot tall, turns yellow and dies. How come in this natural ecosystem, we can produce 300 foot of vegetation without fertilizer? So obviously there's something going on in a natural ecosystem that is not happening in an agriculture ecosystem. Let's take a look at the, the differences and try to develop a system of agriculture that mimics a natural ecosystem for providing fertility and, and all these sort of things. So what are the differences? Well, in a natural ecosystem, you got you know, roots that live the entire year for several years. You get long photosynthesis, there's no tillage, Soil surface is always covered, and there is a diversity of vegetation, not just one plant species, many plant species in multiple layers. And to contrast that with our agricultural ecosystems, we have roots that live a few months out of the year, especially if you look at a corn soybean rotation. Photosynthesis only occurs for a few months out of the year. It's most often tilled, I think. Uh, only about 30% of the world's cropland is, is no-till. That means 70% is still tilled. I think that's actually U.S. figure. I think worldwide, it, it's even 
lower adoption of no-till. Uh, soil surface is bare much of the year, and it's monocultures, one species of plant grown at a time. So, uh, Paul Yasa, uh, University of Nebraska, is real fond of saying that the difference between the surface of the moon and the surface of Earth, they both have the same geology, the same minerals, the same rocks on both bodies. The difference between the surface of the Earth and the surface of the moon is biology. Biology has the ability to turn rock particles into soil. In fact, you can turn rocks into soil. Here's a picture of a lichen. A lichen is sort of like a little ecosystem in and of itself. A lichen is not one organism. It's actually a symbiotic relationship between a plant, moss, and a fungi. And the plant supplies root exudates, sugar from photosynthesis to feed the fungi. And that fungus dissolves rock and turns it into soil that the moss can extract nutrients from. What a cool deal. You get these root exudates supplied by photosynthesis. So sunlight, water, broken down photosynthesis and carbon dioxide converted into liquid sugar that feeds mycorrhizal fungi. And the mycorrhizal fungi send out these threads to bring water and nutrients back to the plant. And at the same time, the plant is feeding the mycorrhizal fungi. The mycorrhizal fungi respond to this generosity by feeding a whole host of microbes that cover their surfaces. And the mycorrhizal fungi also exude a compound called lomalin that is the most powerful soil aggregating agent we know. And, and we'll revisit that. But the re end result is that you get, when things work right, you get this rhizosheath on these roots, this intense area of biological activity in the rhizosphere immediately surrounding the root system. And so when this all happens like it should, like it happens in natural ecosystems, fertilizer become, can become unnecessary. Irrigation can become unnecessary. You have plants growing with minimal need for human intervention. That doesn't mean it's easy. I've got, I mean, it, it's not as easy as just going without fertilizer. It doesn't happen that easy. It doesn't mean just shut off the irrigation system or that you don't need rainfall. But when you mimic these natural systems, everything starts to work better. And, and you know, the just don't fertilize thing, I've got entire chapter in the book on that topic and um, it's a long slow process but it's one worth pursuing so your goal as a soil manager i want to set some goals here what it should be if you want to create a truly functional soil here's what you want to do first of all you want to maintain good soil oxygen levels so we'll talk about how you do that you want to capture rainfall we'll talk about how you do that Maximize photosynthesis, uh, how you do that, and increase soil biology. If you do these things, your soil will reward you. Productivity at levels you're not accustomed to, with a much lower level of required inputs than you're accustomed to. More production at less cost and more societal benefit. Okay, so oxygen. First of all, you look at this root system on the sorghum. See how shallow that is? How it just flattens out, and and there's no 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 root. So what stopped these roots? 
So, oh, I hit the hard pan. Well, uh, I got news for you. That hard pan doesn't stop roots because it's hard. It stops roots because it is a barrier to the penetration of oxygen into the soil. And oxygen, roots need at least 10% oxygen in the soil atmosphere. Now, above ground, um, the atmosphere above us is 21% oxygen. So when half the oxygen is used up in the soil atmosphere, but more than half the oxygen is used up in the soil atmosphere, roots can't grow anymore. So this hard pan is not, doesn't stop roots because it's hard. I'm sure you've all walked down a city sidewalk and seen where roots have broken concrete sidewalks. Probably seen where roots have broken asphalt. If they can break concrete and asphalt, this hard pan is not a mechanical barrier. It's an oxygen barrier. There's not enough pore space to allow oxygen to diffuse into it. So what do you do about it? What do you do about it? Okay. Well, <laughs> we've gone to some great lengths over time to try to loosen soil. I've got a story about um, one of my great, great grandfathers um, experimented with dynamite. In fact, he had a, a, the governor of Kansas at the time came and visited his farm and, and explored the use of dynamite in loosening the heavy clay soils and, and increasing soil productivity. I can tell you dynamite isn't the route to go if you want to lose in soil, but it's a lot of fun to try. My, uh, my father, when, he, when I was about 13 years old, decided he was going to build a corral in a, a rocky pasture, an area where it's just solid rock. I mean, no, no topsoil at all, just solid limestone. He thought, boy, this would be great because we'll be able to work cattle, whether you know, rain or shine. We don't have to worry about it being too muddy to work cattle. Well, the problem is it's really hard to dig post holes to build your corral in, in solid rock. So dad then got some, uh, I think he bribed a quarry foreman with some uh, Jack Daniels and um, got a hold of some dynamite. And uh, we, Stuck dynamite down in a little hole we dug and lit the fuse and ran back to the pickup in about two seconds. There's the loudest noise I've ever heard. There's this geyser of rock shooting straight up in the air. And then uh, you know, we were probably 100 yards away from that. And then a little bit, these fist sized rocks start dropping on the pickup again. And uh, my eyes were this big and I looked over at my dad and, and he goes, well, that worked pretty well. Let's do another. And so I, I, in that moment, I looked at him and I said, I've, I've got the coolest dad ever. But dynamite's not the way to lose some soil. Number one, we can't afford it. Number two, it's dangerous. Number three, it's illegal. Number four, it just doesn't work very well. What does work is the creation of macro. Macropores are these big vertical channels within the soil that allow for passage, like a snorkel, passage of air down into the soil. And so you, um, what creates these macropores? Well, first of all, let's look at, we used to have macropores and naturally ecosystems have macropores. Why do we no longer have macropores? Well, it's because of tillage. These are two soil cores taken basically on either side of a fence line. On one side of the fence was native pasture. The other side of the fence was tilled cropland or historically tilled cropland, currently in no-till, but had been tilled for well over a hundred years. And this core, uh, the, these two little round circles here, these little coin looking things here, this one is from three foot down in the native pasture. And you'll notice it is red in color. Red indicates that this is 
oxidized. The iron compounds in the soil will essentially rust, become oxidized, and turn red when they're exposed to oxygen for a long period of time. This one over here, which came from the cropland, is gray. And that's an indication that there's a lack of oxygen for a long period. Tillage shut off those macropores, severed them. It's kind of like, you know, there is a big difference when you're snorkeling, whether your snorkel is an inch below or an inch above the water surface. You have to have connection on your macropores, continuous connection to the surface in order for them to be effective. Tillage cuts them off. Another important thing to realize about oxygen in the soil, in the growing season, uh, the vast majority, I've been told about 98% of the oxygen use of, in the soil is by microbes. And plant roots get very small amount of the oxygen that's in that soil. So during the the summer, plant roots are having to compete against microbes for oxygen. But in when soil temps drop below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, microbes become inactive. So once they're inactive, all of a sudden there's a lot of oxygen in the soil. So once you know that, once you understand that, you can make use of it. That's why in a corn soybean rotation, your ground tends to get hard, hard pans tend to solidify. In, in no-till corn and soybeans, you will tend to get a hard pan because you only are growing summer crops in that rotation that are having to fight against microbes for soil oxygen. They will, they will not grow into that hard pan and they won't loosen it. It's only when you get crops that have root systems within your rotation, crops that have root systems that will grow when the soil temperature is below about 50 degrees, you get that hard pan broken up. You don't do it with dynamite, you don't do it with the subsoil. You do it with roots that grow actively when the soil temperature is below 50 degrees. And I'll show you an example of what happens when you do that. So if you plant a winter cover crop, this is one of my favorite sets of pictures here. When you plant a winter cover crop, this is two sets of pictures. One on the left over here is, these were taken with an, a camera that was inserted inside a plexiglass tube. And this picture on the left, this white streak through here is a canola root. It's underground, part of a cover crop mix that was terminated without tillage, so it's chemically terminated, and no-till planted soybeans into this cover crop. And this picture on the right, taken from the exact same spot, this dark streak is a soybean root three months later. Notice that soybean root used that canola root channel as a pilot hole. Why could the canola go through hard pan it's because it's a cool season crop growing soil temperatures below 50 degrees drills uses that enhanced oxygen content to poke a hole through the hard pan and make it easier for the soybean crop to follow. Now canola roots about the size of my thumb in diameter and I want you to imagine the hole in the hard pan you can get when you use one of these big nitro radishes. Now, people, uh, the, the tillage radish, nitro radish, is probably the plant that did more to advance the cover crops than, than any other single plant. And I think we all owe Steve Groff uh, a big debt of gratitude for developing the tillage radish. But it's not the end all be all of compaction breaking because, yes, it does create that big macro. But the next thing you have to do in order 
you know, once you build the highways and the, road, the, the interstates, highways, now you need the county roads, the county blacktops and, and the dirt roads to diffuse oxygen into pores and crevices to nourish the entire soil ecosystem. And you do that by creating aggregates. And you create aggregates, number one, you have to have the fine fibrous roots in combination with the big tap roots. This is a, a photo that Andrew Ruschel uh, sent to us. And this is where uh, a radish root was and it winter killed and rotted away. And these fine fibrous roots you see here, creating like a manifold conduits to conduct oxygen in between all these soil particles. This is annual ryegrass roots. So diversity is important. Yes, the radish roots are great, but if all you do is grow radishes, you're going to get a very temporary improvement in soil structure, very temporary. Need the full package, the diversity cover crops, and not just the plants. In addition, I talked about the glomalin secreted by um, mycorrhizal fungi. This oat plant over here to the left, um, that, see how much darker and better aggregated that soil is? Glomalin is the most powerful soil aggregating agent found in nature. This oak plant over here was not inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. You notice how the soil just fell away like powder, because it was powder. Look at the darker, more better aggregated structure we have, mycorrhizal fungi. So mycorrhizal fungi not only improves your drought tolerance, improves your nutrient uptake, it also makes your soil better. It is an essential part of soil improvement. Now the next task is to capture rainfall. Yeah, doesn't matter where you live. I have a customer that calls me, he's from Georgia, and all he does is complain about how dry it is in Georgia. I ask him, what's your annual rainfall? He says 60 inches. So well, that's more than double ours. And he said, well, we don't get it when we need it. Well, that may be true. But it doesn't matter where you farm or how much rain you get. It never seems to be enough when you need it. Uh, and every farmer I talk to farms in the driest, most inhospitable place to farm on. Well, I'm going to call BS on it because I'm going to tell you a story from what may be one of the driest, most inhospitable places on Earth. And that is Al Beda in Saudi Arabia. Two and a half inches annual rainfall, 120 degrees or more in the summer. And the major industry here, now if you ask a million farmers, what do you do in this situation? What are you going to grow? What, you, what would you do in this situation? I'd guess 999,999 would say move. Like, what else can you do? What can you do in this area? You have no soil. You got steep slopes, no rainfall. What do you do? Well, I'll show you what they did. First of all, the industry in this area is sheep there. So they raise sheep. They milk the sheep, they turn it into a, really a famous cheese. It's not far from Mecca. So they sell this cheese to the travelers coming to Mecca on the pilgrimage. And the problem is, <laughs> their number one problem, you ask these farmers what your mind problem is, <laughs> it's going to floor you. It's flooding. They lose their livestock to flooding. Just washes them away because when it does rain, See these steep slopes and no soil? Water goes rushing down the hills and accumulates in these little valleys here called wadis, these little dry stream valleys, because that's the only place there's anything green to eat. That's where all the livestock are. And when it rains, they get washed away. So what would you do? Well, here's what they did. First thing they did is all these little wadi streams, these little dry streams, 
they constructed these rock dams across these streams so that when rainwater comes washing down, uh, it, it is slowed. And then the overflow is channeled out of the streams and onto the uplands with these contour terraces here. See this little dry stream here? And these wings that come out of there, this is, this is on the upslope, but it's this here is slightly downhill from this. So it's, you know, over here is uphill from here, but it's downhill from here. So the water is channeled out of the stream onto the uplands. They start at the top of the slope. So they took the resource they had, rocks, made use of them. And this is one year after Salem grants. This is eight years after. How cool is this? Here's the fall. Two and a half inches annual rainfall. Look at that grass. Now they've got some. They've got the basis for an industry. They got the basis for prosperity. Think how many more sheep this can carry reliably than the picture I showed you eight years previous. You want to learn more about this. This is a truly inspiring story. This will give you faith in the future of humanity on this planet. Go to YouTube, look up the story of Albeda. Um, it, it is a wonderful story. Um, and that's not the only example where people have overcome amazing odds. Oh, here is, is Olin Taitamo. This is in Peru. Um, this is uh, hundreds and hundreds of years old, maybe more than a thousand years old. Uh, this predates the Incas, in fact, and this is 70% plus slopes. They found a way to farm on 70% plus slopes. And again, it was stopping water runoff. That was paramount. Stop the runoff. And they've got diversion ditches that funnel water down from each of these little terraces, and the overflow goes down to the next terrace. And they were growing when this was first discovered by uh, people of European descent. Um, they found that they were growing 80, 80 different species of crops on these. And as many as 80 different varieties of potatoes, 70 some different varieties of corn, uh, tomatoes, including perennial tomatoes. I mean, the, the diversity on these is equal, the plant diversity is equally as amazing as the engineering ingenuity that it took to build these. This, this is rice terraces in the Philippines. How impressive is this? Look at these slopes. What is that, 30, 40% slope? And they're growing something that requires perfectly level conditions, paddy rice on these slopes. You say, well, that's, that's a way of doing things where it's, what if you have too much water? You know, it's like when I describe Southeast Kansas where I live now, I, people, I said, well, I live in a desert where it floods all the time. It seems like we always have either too much, or we're begging for rain, praying for rain, and then we're praying for it to stop raining. It seems like there's no in between. What do you do when you have too much rain. How do you have flood-proof crops? Well, this is a schematic, a, a artist rendition of the Chinampas of ancient Mexico. This is from around Mexico City, wet, the big wetlands around there, and they have floating farms. They can make these bundles of reeds and, and tie them together and then dredge mud, all the fertile muck out of the bottom of the lake there put it on top of the reeds and use that as a platform to farm on. They anchor it with these stakes so it doesn't float away, but it rises up and down with the lake level so they never lose their crop to flooding. And then they're, they're in a, an obvious floodplain. How ingenious is this? This is self-fertilizing, self-irrigating. And you harvest it with canoes and you can dangle a little fishing line out 
you can be fishing and farming at the same time. Is life getting any better than that? Yeah, it's, it's great. Um, and when I was writing my book, uh, one of the things that amazed me is how independent of one another, ancient people discovered very similar, very similar ways of dealing with similar sets of circumstances. Because this is in um, southern, close to Central America, uh, technically still North America, but southern Mexico. This is in Iraq. This is the marsh Arabs along the, the where the Tigris and Euphrates River come together. And they're doing the same thing. Bundles of reeds and they farm and live. Their houses, they don't have flood damage to their houses. Their houses float. They go up and down with the floods. And so does their farms. And, and they construct both farm and house out of bundles of reeds. And in Myanmar, um, what we used to call Burma, this is a floating tomato farm. And they're doing the same thing, self-irrigating, self-fertilizing. And what if you, you're fluctuating between too much rain and too little rain? This is uh, something that um, Mel Landers sent me. This is called the uh, Indigenous American Raised Bed Farming System. Um, so what happens when you fluctuate between too much and too little water? Uh, here's what you do. You create these raised beds and you dig the, out of digging these little holes here. And when water runs off, it goes, you get too much rain, it runs off and it gets in these holes here where it's stored. And then when you get too dry later, you've got that water Instead of running off, it's stored for use later. And to keep water from in fact, to keep water infiltrating to the degree you need, keep it from running off and keep it from evaporating, you mulch everything. And then you plant these tree crops, these perennials on these beds. And while they're little and developing, you plant annual crops around them. And when everything's all together, uh, you get an extremely productive ecosystem. You say, wow, this is really cool. Why aren't we doing this now? Why, why aren't we doing this now? There's an obvious answer. And that answer is that um, if you were to duplicate any of those efforts, it would take a lot of money. You know, that, those things are quite practical for subsistence farms. But probably not practical in this era for for commercial farming. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how you could ever monetize those those practices. Um, however, we don't need to go to those extremes. And I'll give you an example of what we can do if all of those systems work because primarily they reduced runoff. They promoted infiltration and reduced runoff. So how do you do those things without big, expensive improvements? Well, this is a, a rainfall sim, a USDA rainfall simulator, uh, something Bud Davis came up with. And you put different soil, you know, you cut a little slice of soil from a field, different treatments, you put it in these inclined pans, and then you measure the runoff. And this is what happens after a simulated two inch rainfall. Look at this tilled soil. Look at how much water ran off that soil. Look at the color of that soil. That looks like chocolate milk. This no till cover crop soil, virtually no runoff and no soil loss. This is where we want to. So you don't need to build stone terraces. You don't need to build floating farms and all this. Although that's really neat. On practical matter, you no-till and you cover crop. We can incorporate that into our current agricultural system. So 
most amazing thing about that rainfall simulator demo. If you've never seen one, you need to. Okay. And when they flip those pans over at the end of the demo, flip them over, the no-till cover crop, you know, the water has soaked all the way through. How alarming is this? This is the, the conventional tillage, no cover crop pan. Two inch rain and water did not soak in. How long is it before this field is thirsty again? What percent of the moisture that fell on this is susceptible to runoff? What percent is susceptible to evaporation shortly after? That's what leads to tillage and fallow lead to dysfunctional soils when it comes to water erosion. This picture, I took this in Western Kansas a couple years ago. This is 10 days after uh, 1.1 inch rain, just 10 days after. Where did this water come from? It was only an inch of rain, just an inch of rain. This water ran off from all this surrounding area. This is maybe at most a two or three percent slope, at most, and you had runoff. Powder dry soil, one inch rain and water ran off. And it's sitting here, it's not soaking in. Over here, now this obviously, is, they've got wheat planted over here to the right. There's a dust storm blowing in the background that made it hard to even drive down the road. And it's too wet to plant and too dry to sprout. This is soil from that field. It's too dry to sprout wheat in the same field, a few feet apart where it's too wet to that is a truly dysfunctional soil. So how do, you, how do you make it functional again? Well, first thing, stop tillage. Look at this. This is the infiltration rate, of moldboard plow, chisel plow, and no-till. No-till, water runs in three times faster than no-till versus moldboard plow. Stop tillage. That is absolutely essential for storing soil plow. The next thing that you do to increase infiltration is have cover, have mulch on that soil. This is right across the road from that dysfunctional soil I showed you, right across the road. And look at this. You can reach under that straw mulch. This was harvested with a stripper header and chemically fallowed rather than tilled. And, and, and there's better systems than this yet, and I'll talk about some of those. But you can squeeze moisture. This is across the road from the previous pictures. Powder dry soil that couldn't sprout wheat. Look at this. You can squeeze moisture. You can squeeze that into a ball right across the road from the fields. Look at the numbers. Look at this. The more straw you put on the field, the faster the water infiltrates. You need mulch. You need soil cover. If Look at what happens when you have soil cover. This is during a downpour. See the property line here? This guy is growing cotton without cover crops. Guy right, is growing cover with a mulch. You don't have enough mulch, how do you get it? Folks, you grow it. Grow cover crops. This is a photo period sensitive sorghum sedan. If you want to grow a lot of mulch, way out of this. Grow a productive cover crop. You say, oh, wow, how do I plant through that? Well, <laughs> here's an option. You can use a roller crimper, knock this stuff down, and plant right into it. Here's a close up of that roller crimper. It mashes that stuff down in soil contact, and then you get this beautiful mat. This is actually my brother's garden. And look at that beautiful mat that you can plant into. And I, I should have included some pictures from his, his garden this summer. It was absolutely amazing. That, that's a cover crop of rye and some turnips that overwintered and some crimson clover. You can see little red blooms here. Absolutely beautiful mulch. Uh, didn't have to hardly pull a weed all summer. 
beautiful system. This is one of our organic farmers uh, customers. Um, he is roller crimping this cover crop of berry vetch down, planting in the same pass. The, the roller crimper is killing the hairy vetch by crushing the stems, making it impossible for it to live. And how beautiful is this? Complete soil coverage. That ground is not going to erode. When it rains, it's going to slurp that up just like a sponge. It's going to keep it in there because it's going to keep it from evaporating. And the other thing, what, what's the biggest barrier people have? Biggest problem people have when they farm organically? Weed control. No herbicides, no tillage. Weeds. Does it get any more beautiful than this? The entire weed control task is being accomplished by this mulch, excluding sunlight from this. And, and, and here's, here's another one. You can see uh, right to the line, to the left of that line is where uh, there was a cover crop. To the right of the line, there was not a cover crop. Uh, this was a cover crop of annual ryegrass. Look at all the weeds growing where there's an abscess of cover crop. Um, if you're interested in using cover crops to control weeds, uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but I do have another video on, on YouTube called Innovations in Pigweed Control. Uh, get on our YouTube channel and check it out. Uh, you'll be glad you did. Um, and then once you have water in the soil, you wanna hold on to it. And one of the ways to increase the water holding capacity of soil obviously, is to increase the organic matter. You look at the research numbers here. This is, you can see on any soil texture, as you increase the soil organic matter content, you increase the water holding capacity of the soil. The other way to hold on to more water in your soil is to keep it from leaving by evaporation. How do you reduce the evaporation? Well, um, I'm going to take a look at ancient wisdom again. What did people who were in areas with an intense evaporation, what did they do? Let's take a look. This is uh, practiced by the Zuni Indians and on the Arizona, New Mexico border. Um, this is, is still practiced to some extent in the area. And they built these gardens called the, we call waffle gardens created these little pockets in the soil and planted crops in them. And the garden had a wall around it that diverted the hot, dry wind up and over the crop, to keep it from getting dried out. And in these little pockets, which are meant for holding water, um, they would put some organic matter, whether that's you know some compost or a common Common material was uh, flood debris. You'd go along streams after rain, collect all the flood debris, carry it, put it in here. They'd plant crops in there, like a corn bean squash, the three sisters. And then they would mulch that with ground pebbles. Because the pebbles would allow water to run over them without absorbing it. And that they would protect that moisture from being evaporated by sunlight. And so this was an extremely efficient way of raising crops on very limited amounts of moisture. So the next thing I wanna talk about, you see the problem with this slide. This is 90 bushel wheat. This is 90 bushel wheat and the photo was taken on June 21st. What's, what's unique about June 21st? What do we call, what's the name of that day? June 21st, what happens? It's the summer solstice. This is the longest day of sunlight in the Northern Hemisphere of the year. What is not happening on the longest day of sunlight of the year? The answer obviously is, photosynthesis. None 
of that sunlight is being captured and used. If you think of your goal in agriculture to capture sunlight and convert it into something useful, you're failing. We are miserable. We like to thump our chest and you know, puff up our own self-importance and pat ourselves on the back. We're the most productive. No, we're not. We're incredibly inefficient. Now that is in one way is depressing. Another way is encouraging because it shows me how much potential is still left out there. What can we accomplish if we actually capture if a, even a minimal percentage of the sunlight that falls on the property? Obviously, in this field on this day, we are not. Now we did a month earlier, but we're not on this day. Take a look at this. This is soybeans right after planting. What percent of the sunlight is being captured by these soybeans? Obviously, it's 2%, 3%, 5%, I don't know, not much. This is in June as well, longest days of the year, and barely using the sunlight that's falling on that. Is there a better way? Because remember, it's sunlight being captured by photosynthesis that fuels this entire soil improvement process. Every day we're capturing all the sunlight, we're feeding soil, we're changing soil. And we're not doing that in either of the previous two photos. So this is Jason Mox. If you're not on his constant canopy social media stuff, you need to get on. If you're interested in farming, you need to be on it. If you're interested in the future of this planet, you need to be on it. So what this field is, it looks like someone did a really bad job, a really bad job of drilling wheat. Look at those skips. Uh, folks, there's a method to this madness. So take a look at this. Uh, here are skips, four rows of wheat, skip four, plant four. So, Here's what happens a short time later. Comes back in, plants soybeans in those skip rows. Twin row of soybeans. This is that field just prior to wheat harvest. Look at how far along the soybeans are. And then this is shortly after wheat harvest, like a week or 10 days after wheat harvest. You're off to full photosynthesis. Now think back, there's a previous photo. Think back to the picture of the, the 90 bushel wheat ready for harvest. No green, no photosynthesis. See, this is almost complete photosynthesis here. This is virtually just a week or so after harvest, you're already using full sunlight. Neat thing about this system is Jason has harvested 90 bushel wheat and 90 bushel soybeans from the same field, the same year. And it's all by harvesting, thinking of yourself as a harvester of sunlight, not a grower of wheat or a grower of soybeans, a harvester of sunlight. Here's another way to think about harvesting sunlight. This is corn, and this is a cover crop that was planted at about B4 stage of the corn. You don't want stuff emerging at the same time as is in the corn, senses the competition, triggers a bunch of hormonal changes. Corn just doesn't yield very well. So you need to have no competition in the immediate vicinity of the corn plant when it emerges. But three, four weeks later, stuff comes up, it's not a big deal. This does not hurt corn yield. This was all this complex cover crop mix was planted after the corn got a good head start, so it doesn't really compete against the corn. You say, why would you do this? It doesn't help the corn. Uh, it really doesn't help the corn. What it does do is it gives you an entire second crop. Now it's not 90 bushel wheat, 90 bushel corn, two grain, or 90 bushel beans, two grain crops. What it is, is it's a grain crop plus a forage crop. One of the hardest times to provide quality forage in a grazing system. If you're truly managing grazing and trying to strive for high quality grazing, you are 
basically um, at a shortage of feed, quality feed in the fall. This supplies that quality feed in the fall. This is a lot of tons of sunlight stored over the summer that would otherwise go to waste, hit bare ground in between core plants, and it's made to provide a massive amount of fall grazing when you really need it. Here's another way of using summer. Why have put yourself in the position of having to replant your cover crop every year? Take a chance on establishment. Why not a perennial cover crop? So this is a perennial cover crop of white clover, and it had a strip sprayed out into through it. I've also seen, and we we actually have a webinar um, on this topic. Uh, Dan DeSutter and, and Rick Clark have. Are doing this organically uh, along these same lines in this particular field. This was not done organically. A strip was sprayed, corn was planted in it, and um, here's the idea. You know, this is planted once, lives for years, and the uh, this clover suppresses weeds, prevents erosion, and fixes nitrogen. And once it gets to the point where it might start competing against the corn, um, this is uh, from Dan DeSutters, and uh, this is a device called a Romo, and essentially uh, it's a lawn, you know, bunch of hydraulic motors with lawnmower decks. They go in between those corn plants, and they they chop that vegetation weeds clover, blow it to the, see all that is blown up against the base of the corn plants, to mulch the corn plants. And as that stuff decays, it releases nitrogen while it suppresses weeds and conserves moisture. What a beautiful system. Now that there's a lot of, this is not a perfect system. There's a lot of things to figure out. Okay, but what promise? What cleverness. Uh, this could be, and, and of course, the clover regenerates before the corn gets harvested. So you've got incredible stock after harvest, stock pasture, got high protein clover to blend with all the, the corn husks and stalks and grain and leaves. And you can generate a tremendous amount of feed off that acre in addition to the corn crop. And you're doing it without the need of nitrogen. What a cool system. Now, I want to tell you this. This is one of my favorite stories. This is Edward James Citrus Road down in Florida. And uh, citrus in Florida is being just absolutely decimated by a disease called citrus green, it's spread by a little uh, insect called a psyllid kind of similar to a leaf hopper. And it's a bacterial disease, so fungicides, so forth, don't prevent it. Antibiotics will. You can inject antibiotic in this tree in massive amounts, but that's incredibly expensive. And then you can't sell the oranges, so what's the point? Uh, so you can tell that this was once a solid stand of or orange trees, and they're almost all gone. This tree is just about dead. So um, Edward is contemplating his post orange orchard of the career, what he's going to do after all this is ruined. And this 12 foot alligator, his kids spot this 12 foot alligator walking through the orange trees. And uh, they shoot it, they butcher it, they eat it, and they bury the entrails and all the things that you don't want to keep off an alligator. They buried all the remains amongst the orange trees. And lo and behold, the orange trees around that dead alligator spontaneously recovered from citrus root. It's a bacterial disease just boom, recovered from. Why? Well, I've got a lot of discussion on this in the book, but essentially, 
healthy soil creates healthy plants. And uh, there's a number of mechanisms by how that works, but healthy soil creates healthy plants. And it, now, obviously you can't, and, and what makes healthy soil is organic matter. Now it's, it's, it's not feasible to go out and shoot every alligator in Florida and mulch this orange orchard uh, with organic decaying alligators. But what you could do is grow more plant material. So instead of having, I showed you that, that orange, you know, look at this soil here. It's been tilled bare. This was the university recommendations. Tilled soil, eliminate all competition, uh, you know, keep it sterile and uh, use drip solutions of, of mineral fertilizers. Now, quit all that. Plant cover crops. See, here's some radishes. Here's a bunch of different cover crop materials, uh, species, grew plants, grew plants to restore the health of that soil, the trees, the cover. This is incredibly exciting. Now, how do we create healthy, biologically healthy soil? How do we get more biology? So, well, in natural systems, we have diversity. I described all the, the advantages of natural systems. This is a, a permaculture farm that has plant diversity. And all these plants have, have roles. They occupy niches within them. And this is a fantastic, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, look, look into permaculture. The only problem, the only problem really with permaculture is it's hard to scale up to big commercial farms. Uh, but that, that's not written in stone. You know, this may one day be the way we all farm. Um, but uh, if you're typical Midwest, you know, grain crop grower, livestock grower, how do you take these same permaculture principles and use them to create a healthier farm? And one way is with diverse cover crops. And when you bring this level of diversity with a lot of flowering species and stuff, wonderful things start to happen. One is that insect pests start to kind of disappear. I won't say disappear, they cease to become a problem. Because here's a slug. And slugs are really problematic in a lot of especially no-till fields where we use neonicotinoid insecticides, start this whole bad cascade of effects. Well, what eats slugs? Brown beetles and spiders. When you create this diverse cover crop ecosystem with mulch and so forth, you bring these helpful species back to your system. Here's another thing that happens. See this root? I took this in Hungary, some of the heaviest clay soil you can possibly imagine. And this is a root, a root system that was going down in this soil, four fit in the heaviest clay you've ever seen. Sticky, waxy, just nasty clay. But look at this. This root is four foot down, clear at the bottom of the pit. And it's following an earthworm. Earthworms were creating the macro that allowed that system to work. Again, biology comes to the rescue. How do you get more earthworms? You get more earthworms the same way you get more stray cats. You feed them. And you don't just feed them anything. Look at this. Smooth brome grass leaves did nothing for earthworms. Corn didn't do much for but look what happens when you give them legumes. Earthworms have two critical requirements in their diet, protein and calcium. And legume and brassica foliage contain protein and calcium abundance. So if you want more worms, feed them what they need. And then they can do the work for you. If you do a really good job, you can get really good worms. And maybe not. This kind of worm. This is actually a giant Gibson earthworm from Australia. But I just put it in there to prove it. 
So another way you get soil biology is you modify soil temperature because there is a range that earthworms like. There's a range of soil bacteria. And on this day, this is the outside temperature, 97.6. This is down in Oklahoma. This is a temperature taken under a mulch. This is a temperature on bare soil. Back to that, 80.6, 117.1. What starts happening in microbes at 117 temperatures? Folks, that's, that sterilizes things. That sterilizes things. Now, why do they tell you to boil water when you don't have a sanitary condition? Because it kills microbes. Heat that water up, you kill microbes. People say, well, isn't this much better? People say, Okay, well, yeah, that's better in the summer, but what about in the spring? You want that soil to warm up. You know, that's going to cause you problems. All that mud mulch is going to keep the soil too cool. Let me show you something. I am. Uh, this was first snowfall on my farm two years ago. And I saw these things. I thought this was also uh, a little bit before hunting season. I thought someone has been driving around out in my field. They're probably poaching deer. So I, I wanted to reserve this. My nephew was coming to hunt deer. So I went out there. It wasn't tire tracks at all. What it was is where a local uh, wheat seed cleaner had offered me Parker wagons full of his chaff, his cleanings, to dump, and I dumped them out opened up the gate and made circles and dumped that chaff out there. This melted, these melted spots here are those lines of chaff. The biological activity in the soil, it's like a silage pile, that created enough heat to melt that snow. You create a real biologically active soil and the conditions for a biologically active soil will create a soil that is warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. Warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. Again, what a great deal. Now, the other thing that creates a biologically active soil is manure. Manure is far more beneficial to the soil than the vegetative matter from which it came. It is in Microbes, organic matter is made by microbes. They're trying to build microbes. On this, microbes need it moist. They need it warm. They need protected from ultraviolet light, and they need their protein. They need protein and, and sugar and starch and lipids and vitamins and minerals. Need all of those mixed intimately together. On the soil surface, that that doesn't happen, very rarely happens, that you have all of those conditions met at the same time, uh, especially to mix everything together. So what you do, what happens here is when you have a ruminant animal, cow, sheep, goat, deer, um, or any other animal with a fermenting system, digestive system, will take all this material, they'll take the high protein stuff, the low protein stuff, the high fat stuff, the fiber, grind it all together, mix it, put it into a liquid medium where it's protected from ultraviolet light, it's kept warm, allowed to ferment, and then it's deposited out as this absolute perfect soil improvement medium. Root exudates, Low ground and manure, grazing and manure, not 100%. Want to remember, you need to leave that soil covered. So you try to grow in excess, you graze the excess, retain enough material there, the stems for soil protection, and then you convert the leaves into meat 
or milk and manure. That's how you build soil. And you say, well, I don't have a, you know, maybe I'm just a gardener. I don't have enough area. I don't have fence. I don't have water. So what are you going to do about fence? I, I'm not going to do anything, but I'd recommend you build some. What are you going to do about water? I'm not doing anything, but I'd recommend you provide some. Scientific research shows that animals do better when they have water than when they don't. Uh, they tend to die without it. Figure it out. The, the stakes are too big. If you want to generate more income, and if you want to create better soil and generate more income at the same time, figure out how to grow, grazing, create more grazing opportunities, whether that's grain plus grazing or just grazing, try to figure out more ways that you can generate grazing opportunities off the land. And that might be portable fencing, like this netting here. This is actually one of my neighbor's gardens. And they will take a section of their garden. They will grow grazing crops in the summer on that. And then they will feed hay on it in the winter. So that hay is converted into manure and mulch. And that becomes an incredibly productive garden spot because here. Of course, on a large field scale, cattle work well, sheep also work well. And but even in incredibly small places, this is a picture of the world's smallest rotational grazing operation. <laughs> there are this is basically grazed. These flats are taken out and uh, of, off of a balcony and in the apartment and fed to these rabbits on 30-day intervals, world's smallest rotational grazing operation. And then the rabbit pellets here are used to fertilize. What a slick system. How do you know that you're getting the soil biology you need? How do you measure soil biology? Well, you can send off for a, you know expensive Haney. You know, I'd love the Haney test accomplishes a lot of things, gives us some numbers. But if you want a very simple, and there's other biological tests that are coming up. But if you want a very simple test for biology, check this out. This is the soil your undies test. Bury a pair of white cotton underwear. Tie a flag to the elastic waistband, which does not decay. The more active soil biology the faster this is going to decay. So look at this five years no till with three years covered that underwear is gone. Dig it up about a month after burying. Looky over here. Here is underwear that is completely intact. Conventional tillage. No biology. No biology. So if you really want a, a, just a qualitative indicator of soil biology, see how effective your soil biology is, bury some underwear, dig it up a month later, see what you got. Very important benefit of soil biology is that healthy soils make healthy plants. Healthy plants make healthy food. Healthy food makes healthy we're just starting to really begin to grasp the link between healthy, how healthy soil creates healthy plants, how healthy plants create healthy plants. The microbes in our gut depend on compounds in our food, vitamin, mineral content of the produce that we ground has declined precipitously. It takes twice as much food to get the same amount of nutrients that it took in 1940 because our soil health has declined. Healthier soil makes more nutritious food. When you restore the health of the soil, you restore the health of the food. You create healthy I think a lot of our obesity epidemic, diabetes epidemic, is because our food is simply not nutrient dense enough. Our 
bodies are dealt with we need to be the same nutrition. So when you create healthy soil, you eliminate. I talked about how soil misfunction causes pestilence. Isn't it amazing how some people during this pandemic, people exposed to have the same people with the same exposure, one person gets incredibly sick, the other does not. Why does the immune system of one person fight off COVID-19 and the other person's immune system does not? Why do people with higher vitamin D levels fight off COVID? Why do people who are in good physical condition fight off COVID? are obese tend to succumb much more frequently. It all relates to our nutrition. Our health relates to nutrition. Our immune system relates to nutrition. Pestilence comes from poor nutrition. Poor nutrition comes from poor soil. So what can you accomplish? I'm going to show you a sample from my own personal farm. I dug a pit to put in a Patients are better trench to put in some pipeline for an irrigation system. This arrow is 18 inches deep. Look at this subsoil. 18 inches deep was as far as the roots grew. Had a clay layer here that started at 18 inches, went to 28 or 30 inches roughly. So 18 to 30 inches, super heavy clay. Below that, I had to do soiling. But look at this clay layer. It's gray, which means oxygen and look at the structure no structure looks like play-doh just smeared no oxygen penetration so what i did is i planted what may be the best vegetation there is for fixing soil that is a warm season perennial grass and probably the best of all those in my mind is eastern gamma grass very productive this uh, picture, see my pick up there? This was 30 days after the previous grazing. This is 30 days of regrowth. You can see some flowers in here. I've got some alfalfa, clover, chicory, tree quill. This is not, it looks like pure gamma grass. It's not. It's actually a very diverse mix. The gamma grass is just so productive, it covers it up. This was inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. And every year I dug a fresh trench. This is the, the side of the trench a year after. Look at this. See these little root fragments going down through here? And surrounding the root fragment is dark soil. This is glomalin. Improve that soil. And this is three years later. This is six foot over six foot over. This is the same soil three years later. Here is, I stuck this little fiberglass, white fiberglass rod in at 18 inches deep. Look at that black aggregate soil. Look at the abundance of roots at the same depth that three years later roots could not, would not penetrate. This is how you fix soil. No tillage, 12 months out of the year, root growth, plant diversity, legumes, grasses, forbs, raised to turn the above ground into air, raised moderately, so they're still good soil covers. So no tillage. Basically follow these principles. A lot of soil health talks start with these principles. I'm ending. This is your to-do list. Keep your soil covered. Don't till. Add organic matter materials whenever possible. And one of the best, easiest ways of doing that is to add it in place by converting everything you grow, the plant material you grow, into meat or milk the manure out on the field, let the cattle or whatever livestock generate in place. Keep a living root in the soil, 
365 days and a quarter a year. 365 and a quarter days a year. Use up diversity plants. You have this on your to-do list. You can create soils. This field here, um, I started at 1.9%. I measured it at 1.9 when I took this photo. This was 1.9% organic matter, top six inches. And this past, this summer, I took a sample from that field and it was 8.7% organic matter. From 1.9 to 8.7% in 15, and actually, on uh, that particular field, let me back up a little bit. That particular field I sampled was uh, planted in 2006, same process. And so in 15 years, went almost seven percentage points higher. So, folks, if you want to uh, dig deeper into this, I do have a book. I mean, basically, this presentation was kind of a summarization, a condensation, uh, the Cliff Notes version of my book. Um, if you want to obtain that book, um, send me an email. I'd be happy to ship you one. Um, and uh, I do have a website under construction. Should be should be up and running within a couple of days. And it's, it's pretty rough right now. But uh, just send me an email. Happy to send you. Oh, uh, Noah? Any All right, Dale, appreciate it. With that, um, we're not going to take any questions here this evening, but um, we got this recorded. We'll get it posted later this week and hope Feel you all. Feel free to email me any questions. I'm happy to answer. Yeah, yep. And um, we'll have Dr. Richard Mulvaney on next week. Thanks, everyone.